Guys, welcome to our episode number three of the Only Friends podcast, where me and three friends just randomly shoot the shit about whatever interesting topics are going on in Silicon Valley, in startups, technology, or in Mykonos tri- travel plans. Uh, <laughs> today, joining, we've got Jamie Altright Quint. Uh, sorry, sorry, it starts right now. We've got Tikhon, the Russian Bernstam, and Emmett, uh, Mr. Fantastic Sheer. How are you guys all doing? Oh, sorry, I just doing made great. that up. Good. We're gonna have to. We're gonna come up with some permanent nicknames uh, eventually. <laughs> James is definitely gonna be the permanent nickname. Sorry, Jamie. <laughs> I need Jamie, you look game, really. You look like you're all right with that facial expression on your face. <laughs> what the angry <laughs> facial expression? Yes, this kind of like irritated but hurt facial expression. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, not, I'm. I promise I'll be nice to you. I. I. I people. I, there were comments that I was too mean to you. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna moderate that. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Good. Keep you accountable for that. <laughs> yeah. You hold me accountable. You all hold me accountable to that. All right. So first topic we have on the list. Tomorrow the is going to be the Coinbase IPO. Hopefully we publish it. This is probably going to be published well afterwards, so maybe everything we say will be irrelevant. Or people can call us out on, on our um, our missed prognos- prognostications. But like, what do you, how do you guys think that's going to go? What's, uh, what's your outlook on Coinbase? To the moon. <laughs> I don't know anything about the stocks. I, didn't, only, I think the IPO I is going to go for the first time like three days ago. So like, Okay, okay yeah, let me Coinbase... ask it another way. All right, so good, Tikon, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I think it's going to be like a watershed moment for for like the entire cryptocurrency space. Uh, Coinbase uh, private stock was trading on, on the private markets around a seventy billion dollar valuation a few weeks ago. Today, I checked the implied valuation on FTX, and they're estimate basically the the price is implying a market cap of one hundred forty billion dollars tomorrow. Um, that's that's because they blew away numbers. Uh, since filing the rest one, they recently reported, I guess it was Q1 numbers. They did $1.8 billion in revenue, $1.1 billion in adjusted EBITDA, uh, 730 to $800 million in net income with uh, $220 billion of assets on the platform, 56 million verified users with 6.1 monthly transacting users. Um, so that, that with, with 56 million users, that makes Coinbase larger than Robinhood, Cash App, and Venmo. That's incredible. It's 220 billion in assets. That's got to be a significant portion of crypto assets. Yeah, right? it's, it's huge. It's 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 more than 10 percent. The market cap of all crypto is about two trillion, and uh, for Bitcoin, it's about one trillion, roughly. So That's the whole crazy. decentralization thing was like probably not as important <laughs> as we thought it was. <laughs> like we're gonna buy all these decentralized assets, but we're gonna put them in a place that e- the U.S. government can easily confiscate if they choose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's an expression in the crypto world, uh, not your keys, not your coins. Uh, but, you know, 220 billion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or they're, they're like the dummies like me who are just like, well, you know, it's the easiest. So I think I have, you know, I've got a decent amount of crypto assets just sitting on Coinbase. I'm sure someone could like steal my password. And, and then Yeah, we're very and bad. Like, ne- <laughs> we're, we're very bad, like Neo gold bugs, right? Like the kind of people who used to like hold gold and worried about like having their wealth confiscated or stolen from the government. We, we just keep it all sitting on Coinbase. Well, so I remember. I Turns out that having. TV was a gold bug and he was really into gold. He was always telling me how gold was like, this is pre-Bitcoin. How gold was is like. someone gold. who worked for us? Someone who worked for us. So it's always telling us how gold was like the only safe asset. Like the there's me inflation and your dollars are going to be worthless. And then I asked him like how he held his gold. And. Uh. He like in doll- he was, he was like in dollars. Like, <laughs> he was owning it through like a gold ETF, effectively. Like I don't know exactly what you'd call it, but like like other people like it's like a you know something in the government somewhere. But like if the, things go to like really badly, I don't think you're gonna get your gold out of the gold ETF. Like I don't think that's like in the case of like societal collapse, that gold's gonna be there for you. So I don't I don't know. I feel like there's a but then again, I don't think Bitcoin works in the case of societal collapse. So maybe it makes more sense for Bitcoin. Like you can pretty much assume society is continuing to function because if like everything really goes to shit, unlike gold, which like will still be there, like the gold will still exist, the like internet will stop working. 
right? Like Bitcoin doesn't work anywhere if the internet goes away. You actually it does. You you can transmit Bitcoin over uh, ham radio. You can actually publish transactions. <laughs> so there. Are... <laughs> but who's I don't know how this mining is going to work without electricity. <laughs> and, but like I and blocks and I, Blockstream I has it. a satellite. But Blockstream has a satellite node that uh, you could communicate with too. Good. So you can mine Bitcoin on Mars, but nowhere else. <laughs> Uh, oh, does, one thing I forgot to mention. A, yeah, go ahead. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, their their volume in quarter one uh, this year was more than all their volume last year. So this is how quickly the whole space is growing. And so the market's going to see that growth and just, it's going to, I mean, even with their numbers that are huge, uh, like almost $2 billion in revenue, I mean, the, the market's going to factor in that kind of growth. And uh, yeah, you, you could see some really fun action tomorrow. I mean, their so IPO think, timing is amazing oh, right now, given the, like, the bull run in the last oh. few months. Yeah, RJ, perfect sorry, timing. So, so I think I think everybody thinks that Coinbase is going to do really well this week. But what do you guys think about the the long term prospects of a basically a crypto exchange? And there's a bunch of crypto exchanges. Like, how does Bitcoin? Or sorry, how does Coinbase protect their market position over time with you know FTX and um, you know all these other people coming in and trying to eat up a little bit of their market? Yeah, their their margin is probably not defensible, right? Like, is the hypothesis? Uh, yeah, no, sorry. Qu Coinbase has 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 different products. You're right, but I think most of the money is probably made off the exchange. Yeah, right. Yeah. But like, the reason you're using their, it's like how like if you're a uh, big, your big service provider, your Salesforce, like, uh, you might make most of your money selling downstream, but like, what drives installs and like people using the product at all? is not necessarily the same as the thing that makes you money, but you kind of have this captive audience once you get them installed in your Salesforce thing, you have all the data there, like they kind of have to buy the downstream stuff that is where you actually have your profit margins. And I wonder if like Coinbase is actually, that's a better way to think about it. Like I don't actually know, because I know nothing about crypto really. Like I feel like I know the least of anyone here about that. But like my, my impression is people use Coinbase because the same reason Justin said, it's the easiest way to get the money in and out and then you pay a premium for like your trading and shit, but like that's downstream. Yeah, I think that's absolutely I, I, right. That I mean, maybe. Yeah, no, go go ahead, go ahead, Jimmy. I was gonna say that may be true, but like, how difficult is that part to copy too? Like, if adding a bunch of coins to an exchange is also easy to copy, how hard is um, making it easy to get the money in and out hard to copy? And that's probably what makes it defensible long term, right? Well, I think there's something about having it having a brand, right, with consumers. Coinbase has a consumer brand. Consumers know it. They have trust because they've been built, you know, they're, they're nine years old now, and they've been building that reputation up. So I think it's like starting a new Charles Schwab or Fidelity. It could, you know, it becomes hard uh, to do that because the, the amount of capital you need to, like, you know, build that brand, is, it becomes pretty immense. Like, if you look at, you know, Uniswap, for example, does um, – Binance is doing like what forty billion in daily trading volume or something like that. I don't know what Coinbase is. I assume it's like tens of billions. But by and, and Uniswap, the decentralized exchange is only doing like a billion in trading volume because it's just I, my theory. I mean, it's just so much harder, right, to like figure out how to use. So for normal people, like people like me, who are like I'm interested in investing in crypto, I'm interested in buying crypto, but I don't really want to figure out how to do it in the you know decentralized way. I just want to go on Coinbase, wire the money, and then buy Bitcoin and hodl for dear life. And like text text Brian. So text what's support. in the what's in the S one filing? Like uh, that's one. Like I, I haven't the, read anything. Like I don't know what's 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 uh, been said. I thought I thought one interesting thing from the S one was the uh, breakdown of the cap table. Mark Andreessen pr personally owns ten percent of Coinbase. His fund his fund Andreessen Horowitz owns sixteen percent. Uh, but yeah, so that 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 ten percent is probably worth like fourteen billion dollars. That's it. That's as much as Brian, right? Doesn't Brian? Yeah, it's, it's roughly. It's not that. It's not that different. Um, but Mark, Mark's on the board, and Mark's been really helpful for them. Like back when the SEC was cracking down on crypto uh, a, a few years ago, or or kind of getting close. Like uh, Andreessen Horowitz threw a big dinner at the Angler in San Francisco, uh, like for, for a bunch of the SEC people and like and like and the regulators, and tr tried to kind of show them that there's more to crypto than just like speculation and like and like criminal usage um and so i think in recent horowitz as a firm has been really really helpful to uh coinbase they are in every 
good crypto company and good pr crypto project. But they're, you know, they're, they're also, they're also they're invested in Uniswap. Uniswap. <laughs> Clearly they, they just have the thesis make... like this is going to be big and they just like went hard after like investing everything that looks good, which yeah. in retrospect is genius. I thought that was a great idea. Like, good job. Yeah. I don't know. I think that's, is... that's the, what's great about venture capital is, is rewards go to the people who see the future most clearly and put the mm -hmm. money into stuff that like needs it. Did any of you guys end up investing, investing in Coinbase? In Coinbase. Uh, Tikan, you look no. like you're, you look look sad face over there yeah no i i should have brian gave me my first bitcoin back when he was doing y combinator it was around seven or eight bucks at the time he was giving away like business cards that were each worth one bitcoin if you redeemed them at coinbase like if you signed up and people were just throwing them away in the garbage so, uh, yeah. <laughs> 60 g's right there boom yeah. uh anyway. and so i brian convinced me bitcoin was a big deal so i did start uh getting involved in bitcoin back then but I uh, did not invest in Coinbase itself. Uh, Justin, how about you? Did, did, did he, well, that's, the, that's Bitcoin, almost, I think, did about as well as Coinbase, right? Like, I, Bitcoin did I, better. I think Coinbase hasn't done amazing, but like, if you just bought Bitcoin at any point, has Coinbase actually outperformed Bitcoin? Well, well I think, you don't well, know. well, not really, so, but the, how many people are gonna hold through, how, how many people have like the cojones to hold through a 5,000 X gain or like a 6,000 X gain without selling? In, in right. like it's something that's completely private. liquid where you could sell it at any point in time. I, I feel like that's that's like Tcon and nobody else. <laughs> yeah, basically, <laughs> basically the, the coin base was, was a forced hold and forced, forced hold for nine years. Forced hold on Bitcoin. Bitcoin. So that, that's a real favor, actually. Yeah. Like that, was, that I, was a great investment. Brian, Brian did you right, Tcon, because he got you into Bitcoin. I remember I tried to invest, actually. I put made a little uh, video about this a couple of days ago, but I tried to invest... And because Fong, my friend Matt Fong, who's in our group and we should get on our on the show, uh, was he was screaming about Bitcoin, like ranting about he's like, oh, you got to invest in Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin and something about Cyprus and Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. <laughs> and he was like, we should try to figure out how to invest in Coinbase. This was in 2013 when the, the first like bull market was happening. And I was like, OK, so I just emailed Brian. I'm like, hey, you know, I was interested in investing. Like, are you guys raising any more money? Do you close your seed round? And he wrote back and he's like, yeah, our seed round's closed, but there's $500,000 left through found Funders Club. Like, do you want to, you know, so you could be, you could do some of that if you're interested. And then I was just like, ah, do I want to pay tax to Funders Club? And so I got all like butthurt and totally forgot about the whole thing until like a couple <laughs> days ago when I was like, huh, I think I emailed um, Brian. But the, the funny thing, Emmett, the funny thing, I think this applies to you too, is that we were both part-time partners at Y Combinator when when uh, Coinbase went through, so we actually do own some Coinbase. Yeah, no, I, a lot of owning some Coinbase as a result of that. Yeah, anyway. just, yeah. <laughs> so amazing. I, was, I I got this email that like this week that was like we're going to release your Coinbase shares on the first day of trading. I was like, my Coinbase shares? I have Coinbase shares. <laughs> I have Coinbase yeah. shares. <laughs> exactly. I know. The rich get richer. Um, the, uh, you work for those that, shares. That is I truly mean. the most unfair thing about the world. Um, although actually I think that's one of the things I love about crypto is it is breaking a lot of the cycles of the rich get richer that happen. Like not all of them, because obviously like there's still this huge it asks advantage, but like there's a lot of people who like are kind of random people who just got rich yeah. out of nowhere for no reason other than they like happened to buy, they bought it. They were like, crypto sounds cool. And they bought into it like early. And even for like not that much money, and it like turned to this huge amount of money later. And I actually think that that's, I think that's really good. I think our society undervalues uh, giving random people kind of a chance, like just like, here's a bunch of resources, see what you can do with it. And like, I think most people squander those resources, but a surprising number of people given that opportunity, like do something cool. And I think that, uh, I think it's gonna be really interesting to see what comes out of the second wave of the crypto boom. It's like how, there was this wave of like people who came out of like Google going IPO or whatever, and then went and started all these other companies that have turned into like the next wave of companies. I wonder what that like, as the IPOs and things like that happen and it's Bitcoin gets really big and, and then not just Bitcoin, but like Filecoin goes to the moon or whatever. Like, I wonder, I'll be curious to see what happens. I think it's, I think generally I'm like bullish on the idea that it's people are going to make randomly get like win the lottery, like a lot of people. I mean, it's already kind of happened. I think that you and I are and other non, you know, kind of non crypto Silicon Valley people are a little bit behind it. But the like a lot of these guys who were early in 
Ethereum, Ethereum co-founders or whatever, they went on to start other projects that if you look on CoinMarketCap today are worth like, you know, tens of billions of dollars. Like Cardano is worth like 40 billion or something like that. And like, you know, it was founded by an Ethereum co-founder. There's like so much, there is like this whole ecosystem of like billionaires and millionaires that are, you know, from crypto, um, which is crazy. This coin seems promising. Why don't we drill here? And then people like go, go drilling and like, ah, oh, there's, there's a rich vein of, uh, of, uh, of Ethereum here or whatever. And like, sometimes you hit a hit, like, you know, some coin that doesn't go anywhere and it's just like a scam, but like, you know, you don't know before you start and it's kind of random in the same way. So like every people randomly make money. Uh, one thing that we've had to talk about or that I want to really want to talk about was the, uh, Neuralink video. Uh, did you guys watch that? Yeah. Crazy. It's, it's a, for, for people in the audience who didn't check it out, it's a, a monkey that is playing pong with its mind entire entirely with its mind like with a it has the brain computer interface you know neural neural link i guess you know surgically implanted in its mind that's hooked up to a game of pong and it's playing pong which is i don't know that's pretty incredible it's interesting like that kind of demo has been around for a long time actually like not like a super long time but like that's a what's impressive about it is is it actually reminds you of the boring tunnel if you know the space, like they built a fucking tunnel, like why is there like there's a car in a tunnel? Why is that exciting? Well, it's because of, it's because of the price and the technology and like how they did it. That's interesting. And the same thing is true, I think, for the Neuralink thing. If you're into mind machine interfaces, the Neuralink thing, like the ability to like think something if you have electrodes planted in, like control something, is actually not that new. But the way they did it, the expense, like there's a bunch of things about how the about how the technology works that is new. And so I'm very, I think it's actually really exciting, but I think it's interesting. It's not for the reason it might appear to be on the surface. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's completely and wireless, I... right? Like that, that was one thing that was new is completely wireless and completely enclosed, which like normally in those pre previous things that you've had like wires, like surgically protruding out of your head, which is not the greatest form factor. <laughs> it's... Sorry, these, these sorts ahead. of video, these sorts of videos and demos, I think Elon's even said, these are just like recruiting tools. So much to Emmett's point, uh, they're making these, uh, I, I think the end of that video, Justin, is even like 10, 20 seconds of them saying, come work for Neuralink. Like, if you like this, <laughs> please reach out. I think it's, I think it's just, I think it's just crazy to think about like how, you know, some next generation is going to be like people used to type. That's insane. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, it's like, we have to tell our kids about like, I remember when I first used the internet, which already seems insane. And then in the future, they're going to have to be like, I remember when people actually had to like move muscles to put input into computers. Like how dumb were those people? So what is the, what is the platform? Okay. So BCI, let's, you know, is, is interesting. Cause it's the first thing I'm sure will exist at one point, right? Like Jamie said, and it's going to create this whole new platform for this whole world of new apps, right? Like just like the mobile app and having, you know, ubiquitous uh, GPS created Uber, right? Like, and then all of like the delivery services, you know, it was a platform for a lot more than that. Like, you know, like everybody having a phone in their pocket. So that created Instagram. So what is BCI going to, what's, what's your best idea for like what app is going to come from a ubiquitous BCI? I don't think we know about how it works yet. That's an interesting question, but I like, I don't, I don't like when you think about what, uh, there's the narrow stuff you can do with BCI, like, like just straight up input and output, like normal, but I think that's actually thinking really small. Like what's, what's really powerful about BCI is like the ability to access things subconsciously and like have, have your brain learn to rely on external resources below the conscious level, the way that like you you if you drive enough you don't think about like moving the wheel you think about where you want the car to go and then you just like your body like automatically does what you want like imagine you like have other things accessible to you i don't know a math coprocessor or like all of wikipedia and you, like, you think about something and like you just know you just know you just know whatever it is that you're thinking about if anyone knows if it's on the internet you know yeah. i have no idea what that the consequences of that are but like holy shit like that's going to be a big deal. It's also terrifying because I think it lets you do uh, real mind reading, like truth telling technology, 
And uh, the problem with that is like real, real, like, can I, if you can actually tell people are telling the truth or not, you set up an immediate like cognitive dictatorship because you can just go to be like, are you loyal to the Supreme leader? Do you plan to, to, to betray the Supreme leader in the next two years? And if they answer, if they, they have to tell you the truth. They like, they can't, they say no. And they're lying, you know, and you just shoot everyone who's planning to betray the Supreme leader. I presume no one's planning to do that. You just ask them that question. Have you, are you planning to betray me every day? And you can create a perfect, completely like top down dystopic dictatorship, which is even at the level of thought, which is like not possible today. I mean, and I actually think like, it has a lot of dystopic, them. horrible things about it. Maybe their brain implant just reprograms their brain to just do whatever it's supposed to be doing. But it's this is also right. <laughs> it's it's not just read read only. It's 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 also right. I mean, I think that I've 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 I'm envisioning a more utopian future where everyone's just watching Pornhub in their mind all the time. <laughs> you look so. I mean, that's probably where it's gonna go. <laughs> It's true. The the reality is usually neither as dystopian or utopian as we want. It's like weird and uncomfortable for the old people. That, that's like, like the, you, that's the general pattern. Or they're like mentally texting dick pics back and forth in class. Like that's what I see happening. It's like all the college kids have this high school kids and they're just like, it's kind of like how they use airdrop right now. You know, have you heard of this where people just airdrop random people like photos, you know? It's like people are, you know, they'll be just airdropping dick pics, mental dick pics, like back and forth to each other. It's like, how do you get anyone to pay attention if you can't tell if they're not paying attention? Or it's like, you have to be constantly asking them questions, like polling them, like with the, the mind reader thing to see if they're actually paying attention because otherwise they're just like chatting with their friends in their head. Maybe, maybe they have a be... recording of what you told them that they can play yeah. back at any time. So like, well, maybe it doesn't matter. Or there, there all might learning be will become asynchronous. Aids. Yeah, there might be focus aid, you know, like uh, programs, right? That like kind of block out everything, force you to pay attention. Yes. <laughs> oh. All right. How about um, how about something else? The Apple versus Epic Games lawsuit. Like, what do you, what do you guys think is happening? Is this like a long? This it seems like it's been a long time coming. You know, for years developers have been bitching about. Uh, Apple being a monopoly and taking 30%. What is Epic is like finally, you know, makers of Fortnite finally willing to pay for a lawsuit, you know, against Apple to like try to break this, uh, their stranglehold on the app store. Do you think that's going to work? Uh, you know, Apple for a long time has, has made the argument like, well, we're not a monopoly. You can go to Android, you know, so we're just one of- It happens to have exactly the same price structure we do to the percentage point. <laughs> Just not a monopoly. <laughs> We're an oligopoly. Just to be clear, we're an oligopoly. This is a, it's, it's, it's a coincidence. We just both did all the math and arrived at the same percentage totally it by turns accident. Out, yeah, thirty percent is the mathematically optimal percentage. Like it's provably yeah. optimal. Yeah, it's just weird how that worked. I mean, like, how do you, how do you feel about the issue though? Like, like, like fundamentally. The, I mean. Uh, I think this is one of these areas where we're seeing a lot of evolution in American political opinion right now, like specifically American, right? I don't know. I'm not keeping track of what's going on overseas. I'm sure it's like even there's other stuff going on that I'm, no, I'm not aware of. But uh, Clarence Thomas is sort of sort of issuing a petition, you know, sort of some positions on this kind of stuff. And I think there's a reorientation happening where we're trying to come to grips with the fact that the way we've been regulating companies in the past doesn't fit modern companies very well, because like it's not clear through like traditional antitrust law, for example, that there is a monopoly here. Because traditionally like excess profits are explicitly ignored when you're looking at uh, a monopoly. It's like not a factor. Um, and what's supposed to be a factor is like increased prices for consumers. But like what's weird about the way that like the Apple Google thing works is like, it doesn't really come across as like most stuff's free anyway. And it doesn't come across as increased prices, but they are making too much profit margins. Like what's going on there and like, I just feel like it's, uh, I mean, there's a consumer harm standard too. Right. And like, I, I guess, like, I don't know what the history of what has been defined as consumer harm is. Cause I'm not an antitrust expert, but when you have to use like the audible app, I think they like recently changed it. And it's like, you want to download an audiobook and you have to like open your web browser, re-log mm -hmm. in, like 
research for the thing you were looking for, find it, buy it, or you get price dif- differentiation because you're buying it on the app store by like exactly the amount of tax that the Apple tax is. So companies can actually afford to sell it for the, I mean, they're, they're selling it for more, but they're really getting the same amount out of it. Um, I think there's like a consumer harm that's going on there much more in a way, like, I think that case is much easier than, for example, proving that Facebook shouldn't be able to buy Instagram or something like that. That's a good point. I mean, we don't think about it like the small annoyances as consumer harm that much, but it is, it's probably taken years of human life to re-log in and Safari into Amazon and buy the <laughs> fucking ebook. Yeah, exactly. It's, it is extremely annoying that I cannot buy ebooks in the Kindle app. That like that is one of those like like paper cut things that I, just, I hate so much, and it, it more irrationally so too because it really isn't that much work to switch browsers, but it, like it, it hurts every time, and like it, like uh, uh, only because Amazon has like I think pretty good reach with Kindle is that like you know can they even get away with not just paying the Apple tax on that. It's actually a boon know, to. Just, um, I work for Amazon. Print. I have to say, I don't actually know anything about that. I'm explicitly be explicit. I know nothing about that state of that. Anything about that? I'm speaking entirely out of speculation and total ignorance from the point of view of Amazon. I know only. Right. I really just only know about. Touch. I just want to be very clear about that. The lawyers are appeased. The um, it, it actually it's a the Apple tax in a way is a boon to other big companies, big tech companies, right? Because like they can afford it. Like Amazon can has enough branding around Kindle and enough momentum around its own platform that it can kind of force people to like go to amazon.com and buy the ebook there. Whereas like a small startup like would be able GDPR. to GDPR. Yeah. Right. GDPR yeah. is a massive gift to any scale company with billions of users logged in and a crushing penalty on anyone who has less. And I think there's been like research recently that shows this, but this was obvious from the minute the legislature was passed. Like, yeah. It's just or totally even, fucks over the small players. Or even this Apple privacy stuff. I mean, like the Apple privacy stuff obviously hurts Facebook and they've been campaigning pretty hard against it, but it hurts like small app developers and all these other people like way more than it hurts Facebook. Like Facebook is going to be fine. They're going to survive and still make a bunch of money. But, um, you know, small gaming apps or something that monetize entirely off of Facebook audience uh you know facebook's ad network and their revenue is going to get decimated those are the people that really suffer from this stuff not the big companies i was gonna say like that's a, just a general problem with like these like like regulatory burden it tends to fall on the small players harder and i feel like i wish regulators took that more into account and designed legislation so that like as your company gets bigger the regulatory burden increases because like if you're a trillion dollar company you can afford quite a bit of regulatory burden it's fine it's actually not that big of a deal if you're a small startup, that regulatory burden can kill you. If you're a $10 million a year company, that regulatory burden can still kill you. And yeah, and you there's, to... yeah, and there's even a term for this, right? Regulatory capture, as as you know, where incumbents tend to actually like like and embrace uh, new regulations that, that that just create new barriers to entry for like um, against against like new like upstarts. So I want to go back to something that Emmett said, which I thought was pretty interesting, which is that the regulatory frameworks around monopoly that we had in the past basically no longer apply or like I have not, we're not prepared. Maybe we're not written to deal with the firms of today, right? We have these massive technology firms, which are becoming, you know, super, super firms, trillion dollar companies with, you know, that have this massive data advantage, massive user advantage, and are using those two things to basically buy their way into like every industry in America, right? And, and uh, it reminds me of a conversation that you and I had, Emmett, where we talked about the Cozian theory of the firm. I don't know if you remember that, but there was this, there's this theory of the firm, which is that you know, the size of a firm uh, of a company is dictated by the ease of information transfer between like inside the company versus outside the company, right? To like uh, internal versus external uh, information transfer because you know the theory is that like the the easier it is, the 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 more the ratio is like um, the the ease ease lens is is lended towards the internal uh, information transfer. The bigger the firm can get, and I feel like we're kind of reaching. We've we've flipped something where, you know, instead of it being more efficient for there to be many firms doing like many different things, we've gotten to like 
uh, imbalance where it's much more efficient to have this like massive company like an Amazon or Google or and it's kind of broke broken all like everything we know about companies thus far. Yeah. So, so they're like, they're, what is it? Uh, Stratosphere, like, how do you, wait, how do you guys pronounce that? Stratosphere? Oh, Stratosphere. I, yes, I, I think it's Stratosphere. Yeah. I'm going to call it Stratosphere and like, I, I with all apologies, <laughs> Stratosphere uh, has this like aggregator theory idea where like uh, aggregators are basically zero marginal cost uh, demand aggregators, like bring together a bunch of demand and supply into the same place and like match it. And like the internet's enabled these things to scale to this point, like to your point, I think it also has, it's also like the Kosian theory of the firm is very real. And yeah, they get to get a lot bigger than they used to. And I think that's, so, uh, I think that, I think that is the, the thing that's breaking the regulatory framework is partially they can get bigger, but I think it's also just that we're not used to the idea of companies that have zero marginal costs for additional customers that, that those didn't exist before, at least not at like, like media companies work that way, but nothing else did. And media companies could only get so big before, like your media company couldn't also be like a, uh, I don't know, like a shopping website or a, a, a movie theater. But now your media company can be anything. And I think that's the big, like we're all, everybody's the media now. Yeah, so, I think I'm less convinced that the firms are more efficient and more convinced that zero marginal cost user acquisition and just the power of insane network effects is just so powerful that it just counteracts that to an extreme degree. I mean, think about like Craigslist and how much of a pile of shit that product is and how long it took to replace most of Craigslist with other products. I mean, like Craigslist existed and was like the main way people found rentals or I don't know, vacation rentals or some of these other things for like 20 years before Airbnb or, you know, Uber or any of these other things came around that displaced various different parts of it. It just was so hard to displace because of those two kind of effects. So how do you think we as a country deal with these mega firms? I, I feel like there's this, you know, kind of wraparound sentiment where both the far left and the far right are starting to say like, what the fuck and so you have like senator howley right uh the 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 senator most famously known for failing to certify the election results <laughs> coming back with this idea of like you you should be able to buy companies there should be no m a for companies 100 billion valuation or over which was w w widely derided by the tech twitter um they like shit on him they were like this is the stupidest idea ever i actually empathize with the i mean i maybe the implementation is like a very blunt instrument and not going to work for a variety of reasons. But I actually empathize with the idea, which is that, you know, we have some societal reasons why we might prefer a uh, distribution of many companies versus like, you know, this massive few tech companies. Like, do you think that's the right approach or, or is he like a complete total fucking idiot as tech Twitter thinks? I mean, it's good to like, uh, I'm generally in favor of there being more competition and more, more companies competing for the given consumer uh, attribute. But if you look at what companies acquire for their growth, like Google didn't need to acquire anyone to become dominant in search, and like, you know, Amazon didn't acquire anyone to like be, able, be the world's like large leading online like marketplace, and Apple didn't acquire anyone to make fucking iPhones. Like when companies acquire things, it's always into adjacencies. And yes, it makes them more profitable. And maybe that's in some way bad for inequality or something. But like, that's actually not clear to me. I actually think it may, it may prevent those other companies from emerging and them becoming very rich and actually exacerbating inequality. And I guess I'm, uh, I don't think it addresses the core issue that like there's these very strong network effects and zero cost customer acquisition and Stopping acquisitions doesn't do anything about those two problems. And so you still wind up with giant, you know, monopolies or pseudo monopolies like oligopolies in most of these areas. Well, that, well yes, I, I, I agree with that. However, you would prevent them from applying their monopoly in, in their one specific area to like capturing adjacent areas and, you know, becoming like this these massive companies you might just have one massive company in each of these different domains you know 
Yeah, I thought, I, I mean, I thought that the way that everyone was opposed to it was just purely ideological <laughs> rather than based on any sort of objective analysis of the point. I mean, I, I don't really know what I think of the idea of banning acquisitions. It seems like a blunt instrument, I guess. But I, I would say that there's been similar dumb ideas from uh, the other sides of the political spectrum for, for which people will just freely embrace like the concept and discuss it rather than just calling the person stupid. Uh, so I thought that was kind of uh, pretty blatantly just, you know, partisan, but um, I think that there are ways to prevent some of these things. Maybe not now, now that the, the companies have gotten so big, but I think on Stratechery has written a little bit about this and how um, if the DOJ was, f I guess, more forward looking, they could have thought about blocking the Instagram acquisition. They could have, um, you know, thought about some of these things earlier on that actually massively strengthened something like Facebook. I mean, if Facebook didn't have Instagram and Facebook didn't have WhatsApp, the, the usage of Facebook itself uh, is kind of plateaued and maybe I haven't looked at the numbers, but I think it may be even slightly declining. Uh, but the business remains so powerful because they own Instagram, they own WhatsApp. And, you know, obviously, if they weren't so much under the microscope, they probably would have tried to buy TikTok and probably would have tried to just, um, you know, continue on in that advantage rather than, uh, you know, their, their core product isn't really what's driving the business right now. But do you, do you think VCs today would allow a company like 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 say like say Instagram to actually sell for such a cheap price? Like back then, like I think Sequoia had just done a round at five hundred million dollars, and like everyone wanted to show that really quick return on the like one billion dollar exit. But nowadays, I think a lot of VCs would probably not want you to sell. Like look at the speculation about like Twitter trying to buy Clubhouse for four billion dollars, and Clubhouse just saying flat out, "No, we're not interested." Um, do, do you think that's changed at all? Well, back then, a billion dollars, you know, now a billion dollars isn't what it used to be. Back then, a billion dollars was like, that was a lot of money. Now, a yeah. billion dollars is like, it's got to be $10 billion. It's the equivalent of today buying a company for $10 billion after six months or whatever. After you invest it for, at $5 billion, you'd be like, yeah, do it. It's, this is great, you know? I mean, this, this actually happened to Twitch, too, right? I mean, Twitch, Twitch sold for around $1 billion. And I, I, last I saw, Citigroup estimates the current value of Twitch or the tw value of Twitch in a year to be about $20 billion. I think that there's the price point will change based on like, you know, how much capital is available, but like people will always sell for certainty, right? Like the, 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 the time horizon for like a V, if you think about it from a VC's point of view, if you're a partner who doesn't have a multi-billion dollar hit under your belt and this makes your career, it doesn't matter if you maximize the returns or not. Your incentive is always to be in favor of selling as long as good enough exit that it like man he's the guy who did whatever company that's now you know your career is made great uh and i just i don't think that that's fundamentally changed like the structure of venture capital is the same yeah it but do you, think, also, do you think the explosion of all the late stage growth funds and all the new like hedge fund money and even pe firm money coming in is well, could i actually cash out investors who want to get out and show that win and cash out the founders you know, so maybe next time that that next time that that like a Twitch is going to sell, the founders or the, the VCs can say, "Listen, we're we're just going to buy your comment at the same price they're offering, and you guys can keep going." Yeah, for, it's maybe, both happening, there's, there's... and I think it's a big deal. Yeah, because like yeah. when Twitch sold, well, I think two things were going on. Maybe, or sorry, two things were going on. Maybe with Instagram, one is that there was no secondary liquidity. I mean, in 2012 or 20, I forget when they sold, like 2014, 2013, somewhere around there. I think it was 2012. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I remember back then it was like you. Everyone gets paid at the same time. Like you don't get made, you don't make any money until everyone makes money and like the company IPOs. And that's like a modern phenomenon in like the last ten years that people are willing to let founders cash out early. I mean, like fifteen years ago, that wasn't wasn't really much of a thing. And I think it actually makes a big deal because you know if someone comes along with a billion dollar offer and you have ten thousand dollars in the bank you're like yeah that sounds great um but if someone's gonna let you take ten percent off the table and they're like well let's go for the next thing you're like okay sure um so i think i think that was a factor for sure 
there's and then there's also the, the other thing so the, one more thing that with instagram is like since 2013 everyone thought it was like the next coming of 2008 and we're like how do we get out of this thing but you know we've hit the top so mm-hmm. everybody's been calling the top now for like the last eight years and you know <laughs> some year they'll be right the the interesting thing is that there's there are i think there's there are so many more entrants at the growth stage really at the vc stage but also at the growth stage in in investing now than there used to be and uh, it's kind of becoming a much more founder friendly compared you know kind of like what happened with the seed stage in white because of Y combinator you have actors now like tiger global who are out there just throwing down term sheets they have so much money that they're, they're trying to put to work you know they just raised a six billion dollar fund or something like that it's a lot of their own money so they can make the decisions really quickly and they're out there putting up money to work you know very liberally in the traditional context and so it's like tiger global it, stole the money printer from the fed and they're just yeah, setting well, it loose in company offices <laughs> everywhere they've got the money gun and if you have like a functional business that has product market fit it's like like they the interesting thing about that though is that you know if i think if it was easier to raise money with twitch then at least there would have been a competition like a like some sort of like huh should we keep going or whatever but it was like so much harder to raise money compared to getting bought for a billion that, you know, the, 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 one of the advantages that these giant aggregators have had is just superior access to capital. Like if you go back to 2014, 2012, if you're one of these, like, you know, fan companies, you have access to capital at rates that were not accessible to the general public, like to, to, to random companies, <laughs> the general and, public of, 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 of billion dollar startup founders, merely yeah, exactly, billion dollar exactly. startup founders. <laughs> Really, we are the we are the, the oppressed, every man. Yes, the yeah, every man. Um, but, uh, uh, no, but like, but it used to be that like basically they had access to capital to grow your like if you and Google bought YouTube, Google could keep investing capital in YouTube to scale it at much lower cost, like lower cost of capital than was available outside of Google to VCs, and that creates this like real pressure to go inside one of these things where you can get like. They can afford to overpay at any given stage because like they're at cost of because you still need a ton of capital after they buy the company usually and they get that capital more cheaply which then it amplifies the value of the the company to the acquirer and now we've 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 i think that's a really good point i thought about that yeah. that's a big change the cost of capital coming down outside of the big company equalizing means there's not really a big advantage to selling because like you can still get whatever money you need outside also Except a big, the, a big, a big change. I, I 100% agree with you, except for the cost of user acquisition has gone up for you outside of the big fan companies and down for you inside the inside the fan yeah, companies. Yeah, totally. There's a, you know, so you have to be in a business where you don't need to buy customers for money. If you're if you're in the yep. spend money for customer acquisition group of companies, you're fucked. But like, don't be in, don't be in that group of companies, I guess. I guess <laughs> that's the solution. Um, I was just thinking about how like, what we're talking about is like this, the companies do keep getting bigger. I think, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's the dynamics of the business. Maybe it's the cozy and theory of the firm and like information inside the companies to be able to manage larger, more complex enterprises. But like, finally, we're getting close to communism. Like all communism is, is with a point where the cozy and theory of the firm allows you to scale an individual company to the point where it employs every person in your, in your society more efficiently than having them go through the, like the, the, uh, capitalist market would. And like, it just happens to be the computers are now getting powerful enough. Like maybe we can finally calculate our way to communism. It's like, it's coming. It's like kind of exciting. Amazon. It's the wraparound approach. You go so far a capitalist, you only have one company. It's Amazon, you know, <laughs> delivers yeah. everybody the rations. That's, what is that, that, that's called communism. <laughs> well, welcome to communism. When, when Amazon finally runs every single store in the entire world and it's like a maximum full scale or Google somehow winds up being, you know, like all the information of all, everything ever transferred, that's communism. You have one company that runs everything. Well, there's a lot of things okay. Amazon okay. could run that would have made the world better, like the vaccine rollout and mm. I don't know, <laughs> you name well, it. Well, communism's always been more efficient, right? Like communism, you don't have wasteful competition where people are like marketing their thing and like trying to beat the comp, like doing things to beat the competition instead of serving the customer. And like, there is actually a lot of inefficiency about capitalism. It's just that like, Historically, the ability to like figure out how to price things has been so hard. You can't do it like explicitly, which means you need, you need the market system to make it happen. But as machine learning gets better, I mean, 
it's not clear that's true anymore. It would have to be a benevolent single company, though, because otherwise the single company would realize it had all the power and start abusing that power. Okay, uh, you're right. Whereas... It's Fang. You have four companies. Which economy do you want to be part of? The Facebook economy, the Amazon economy, the Google economy, or the Netflix <laughs> economy? Like, those are all, they're all very much available to you, and you can go join any of the four economies you want. They, do you they're think just all fixing, fixing prices, prices on their app stores, stores to be exactly the same percentage? percentage. Yeah, they're, they're all 30%. <laughs> what do you expect? Tax rates are very, very even in the society. I, I don't know. I mean, we're kind of, I'm kind of joking, but I'm also kind of not, like, I don't know. That's a real, like, at some point down the current trends, I don't think we're actually like that close to it with the current set of companies, but at some point down the current set of trends, probably not with the actual fan companies today, but like, I can see companies getting to the point where like they're capable of scaling to the point where they actually run a third of the economy in a single company. Like, I, I don't know. Does that seem impossible to people here? Like, does, can that happen? No, for sure. It could happen for sure. It could happen. I mean, Amazon is already becoming the everything provider, you know, across it's a, it's a movie studio. It's a grocery store. It's, you know, it sells you everything that you, uh, need buy online. It sells like all, sells you all media. It pro runs your web server. It's like everything. It runs your your video game streamer. Ev yeah, everything is powered by Amazon. Yeah, and yeah, one interesting thing, and one interesting thing is that these sorts of like new monopolies are actually uh, like well loved by like like in surveys of like consumers, uh, whereas people might not have loved like the oil barons. Uh, people love getting their packages. Turns out like quick and. Amazon has good service and good prices. And so um, I, I wonder if politically there's going to be as much will to go trying to like go after these guys with state power, given that. Well, what I'm saying is like the people on the left who are like anti the big tech companies have missed the missed the boat entirely. They should be pushing the other direction. They're not big enough yet. The problem is not that they're too big. The problem is not big enough yet. We need them to get like another like maybe like one order of magnitude bigger. And then Don't they can be that. running the whole economy. We're I almost there. You're... We're almost but, there. So how yeah. is that communism? I thought I, I thought the government running running everything was the was was the distinction versus like the one corporation what's, privately held. What's so different about one corporation running everything or one government? There's both or, human organizations, like with some kind of leadership structure. Well, I think we're going to use the labor to... theory of value to pay people. No, we're going to use whatever it is that Amazon. I don't know. Amazon has some leveling system, right? Or Google has some leveling system. You're a level thought... five, whatever. That sounds a lot like communism to me. Doesn't I mean, communism have be the like, to, like to, to, Yeah, d d doesn't communism have like to to uh, to to uh, each according to their need? Like, what if I need like, a private plane more than Jeff Bezos does? Does, does he hand that <laughs> over that's, to me? That's, I know that's how big companies work, right? Like, big companies are are not. You don't get paid in big companies based on like your actual like leverage contribution. Like, being an, an exceptional performer, you might get paid like twice as much as someone who's, who is like a mediocre performer, like three times as much five times as much you're not gonna get paid a hundred times as much as the next guy that's just never that doesn't that's not possible so it basically is like everyone has like a minute very high minimum wage and it's like it's all run on this like kind of over over egalitarian system because that's what makes people happy like actually people want that except it's not efficient in the market economy but like we don't need a market economy because we're this big like you know benevolent dictatorship effectively and all these companies i don't know I, I I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of Fucking around, but I, I don't know. I think it's kind of true. I agree with everything you're saying, Emmett, except that that your your point that the left is not pushing these companies to be ten times bigger than they are. The majority of the left has gone like full corporatist and is like participating <laughs> in, you know, like building these companies up as much as possible through regulatory capture. Okay, how about how about uh, moving on? Uh, we have here our friend Arlen Hamilton uh, sold. Five million dollars of her of her future um, uh, er, carry uh, for her VC funds on Republic, which is like a um, you know kind of like angel list type site. Like you can sell your 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 assets. It's almost, it's almost like an ISA for a VC in a way, right? Like you're, she's selling her for fu her future earnings from her VC fund. Do we think that's like a is that an adverse signal or a good idea? Like I could see people reading it as like, well, this is like a lack of confidence in your future earnings. But I guess in the same way that an ISA is, you know, isn't necessarily, it's just get, you know, you want the trade off to get the cash now. Maybe it's, maybe it's a good idea. 
Yeah, just like for all the I mean, details, I, th I think she sold 10% of all the future fees and carry on all of her funds. So if she goes and raises another fund, her current fund is called Backstage Capital. So that it would apply to her, like the future funds that she raises as well. Um, and so I, I guess effectively she was valuing that 10% that, uh, around um, 50 million. Uh, uh, well, she sold it for $5 million, meaning that the whole thing would be valued around 50 million. Oh, sorry. Just um, so, so she she was selling this to, to like to like retail investors. So these are small pe time people putting in a hundred dollars, thousand dollars. These are not like VC insiders or um, uh, these are sorts of uh, moms and pops who might not understand VC at all or understand how carry works or what the firms are if, if the portfolio is good or not. And so the difference here with ISAs when when Lambda School, which is a company that does IS, ISAs income sharing agreements for like for like for for for, for new programmers. Those, it's, they're, they're not selling like the ISA debt to moms and pops. They're selling it to like big Wall Street banks who are, who are buying, who are on the other side of that, much like with pipe.com, which is another way for people and companies to, um, to turn uh, so-called, to, to turn MRR into ARR, meaning like you're like taking cash flows that you would have gotten way out in advance and, uh, and way out in the future and selling those for, for cash now. Um, and so I kind of prefer it when, it's not retail investors uh, because I just don't think the retail investors are going to typically get access to the same quality of deals that like a VC insider might. Yeah. That sounds I, elitist to me, uh, Sikhan. <laughs> I kind of like that. I kind of like the concept of retail investors. Man. I kind of like the concept of re retail investors having access to everything. But I think the, the difference between I mean, it's like if you can gamble on crypto, why shouldn't you be able to gamble on someone's head, like VC fund? I mean, it's like it's not like if you're buying Filecoin, it's it, it's that much different. Um, and the thing, the difference with ISAs is like ISAs are for people who literally can't afford to go to school. Otherwise, it's not like you can't afford to live your life without an extra five million dollars that you're selling up front. So it really is just kind of like either. It seems like lack of confidence in your current portfolio, either that or just lack of confidence in kind of the the current multiples that the market is giving and you want to, you know, take some risk off the table, which I, I think makes sense, but uh, for some people, but. Well, it also uh, depends I don't on know your, if that's your the way I would do it. <laughs> It depends on how much, you know, you might be in the position, she might be, you know, somebody, any, more, any VC who saw, it takes a long time to make money off VC, right? Like I just started to make money from my work at Y Combinator, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014 or whatever, and it's 2021 now. So it, it does take a long time. So maybe it's, you know, for a lot of people, I think it's, you do, there are reasons to want the cash now. Yeah. I mean, it, when it's $5 million and like, you're going to get rich off of it, like, it's hard to be like, oh my God, like. It's just some like societal changing thing where like we need the people who are going to make fifty million dollars in fees and carry to like get their five million dollars now. But I actually think like there's a big problem in our society where uh, we don't give young people money early enough in their life, and by the time you you've earned enough money to get like buy a house and have your shit put together, like it's like you're like older and it's like hard to start a family. And I actually think we it would be good for to in a way that was non exploitative. Uh, shift some of that money earlier in people's lifespan so they can uh, so they can you know, raise a family and like get started earlier. And if, if this is a, the first step towards redistributing wealth towards the younger people, I think it's probably a good thing. Like I think our society is a problem that we don't give 25 year olds enough money to buy a house. And when we do that, we make houses cheaper, but that seems unlikely. So the other way to do it is just give 25 year olds more money. And I'm, I'm okay I mean, with that. I, I think that that's an interesting idea because, well, at least I think all of us here had a lot of interesting opportunities to maybe not buy a house, but invest in stuff when we were that age and didn't have money. I mean, like I remember um, some of our friends who were able to get into investing in Dropbox in the seed round uh, via like finagling money. And that was like, a, it turned into, it was turned into like a life-changing amount of money when, when Dropbox went public. And you know, I, I know I had some of those opportunities where I didn't have any money and so I couldn't invest, um, you know, but I, I think another trend that's actually pretty interesting right now is P 
people being able to invest like a thousand dollars into these rounds, you know, Angel is doing rollups now or th this new thing they launched where you can basically do like an SPV and let like a hundred people invest, but you only get a single check on the cap table. So it massively simplifies the kind of, um, paperwork component of having all these tiny angel investors. And that may be able to do a portion of kind of like what you're talking about by just like reducing the cost of access to some of these things, not houses, but at least, uh, something. I wonder if there should be other industries that there should, you know, people should have a ISAs for, or like there should be, you know, access where someone's going to make money downstream and, you know, they get, want to get paid out now. Yeah, but I think anything where, where there's a, you do work now to get paid out 10 years later, uh, wants some kind of ISA structure because like, uh, unless you're already pretty wealthy, which is not the normal state of affairs, it's really hard to wait 10 years to get paid. Even if you're going to get paid really well for your work, the fact you have to wait that long creates a big barrier for people to like enter that kind of, do that kind of work into that field. And so I'm actually pretty, I'm pretty bullish on the idea of ISAs. Like basically the magic of finance is shifting money around from the time or the place where it is to the primary place where we need it to be. And then taking a small break as part of that. But like, that coordination is work. Like getting that done, getting people the money at the right moment, in exchange for doing the right thing, so that, so that the societal credit, money is basically credit, right? It's like society give, owing you a favor, or you owing society a favor. Making that available to people at the moment they need it to do something is like a magic trick that we figure, like that really enables a lot of amazing stuff. And I think in people's, the fact people don't have access to, like ISAs are better than debt. It's like right now you have to take on debt to do that, but that's super risky. I say shift more of the burden of the risk onto the investor, and that's good. Yeah, it's like yeah, s selling your future equity versus versus debt. Uh, much much like startups, start, most startups take try to take on venture capital versus trying to take on debt, like during a Series A. So. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And I think for a lot of people's career is being able to sell equity instead of sell debt. Like, imagine if colleges had to had to buy your equity instead of taking on debt. They'd be a lot more careful about trying to make sure that you got a good education that set you up to make money later because otherwise they don't do very well. And so I think the fact that we try to fund education and other things with debt is like a, it's wrong, it's, it disaligns incentives compared to using an ISA, which is basically just, I think, superior to debt for not for everything, but for a lot of purposes. I, I yep. wonder why there's not more ISA like things, you know, I mean, I guess people are, there are some like with Lambda School and there's, you know, but there's, I, like for example, I there was a, a bunch of companies, or well, at least one company that I've I've met with, you know, in the last year, that was helping people negotiate their job offer at at a company. So they they're like a job negotiation coach, almost like an agent for you, right? Like the normal person, which is pretty cool because they were on average getting you know something like ten percent lift or whatever on sizable salary. You know, these are like jobs at like Facebook or Netflix or something like that. So that's like you know could turn it. I think it was like on average, like in the high single digit thousands of dollars or something like that. But, you know, it could be more. You could imagine something that was like helping those people also basically combine, you know, selling their future income and tranching these people into like, uh, you know, I like mortgages, tranching them into, into groups where you'd like sell off the different like tranches of their income to like investors. Like that could be a thing. Like, why is no one yeah. doing that? I think that on the debt side, people have a hard time thinking about like the risk. And I, I think that's like the main limiting factor. So I know some people who are kind of working on ISA space and the hardest thing that I've seen is it's hard for them to raise the debt to fund the ISAs. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the student isn't getting the debt in an ISA, but someone's holding debt and they're going to get paid for it and raising the debt to fund all of those things is really complicated because it's not necessarily like you're going to pitch a bank and you're going to be like, okay, well, we're going to fund a bunch of people to go to this trade school or fund a bunch of people to go to like, I don't know, MIT or Stanford or something like that. And then you're going to own some percentage of their future income. 
that's not exactly like the thing that they're excited to, to run to their boss and be like, okay, you're, we're going to make 10% a year or 7% a year or something on this thing. And they're like, but what's, what's the risk on that? Like, why don't we just invest it in crypto and make a hundred percent a year instead? Um, so I think that's like part of the limiting factor. I know I just, I, I'm really, uh, optimistic that I actually would say, I I believe in people's underlying capability. I think most people in our society are underemployed. I think most people in our society are capable of producing much more value for everyone else and getting paid for it commensurately than they're currently doing. And I see ISA as a pathway to enabling that. And I, I like, it's, it's like an indirect pathway, but like fundamentally there's this issue where we underinvest in people because that person owns, if you, it's like hard to invest in someone where they own hundred percent of their equity in themselves. If you invest in them, it's there's and and you increase the equity value by via the investment. They always got 100 percent. And there's no way to split that that increase. We systematically underinvest. And like I think that's that's where we are. We're systematically underinvesting in people. And you could say the government should do it, and maybe the government should do some of it, but like, like I don't know, private enterprise tends to do things more efficiently and faster. And like at greater scale. And like like if you I don't know, I think there's there's some role for the government to play in like enabling it somehow. I don't have like an well, exact I don't know. Yeah, yeah actually that rule that rule could be making it enforceable like escrow it enforceable to take that income, right? To do the income split. Like that's one of the biggest risk factors I think in terms of you know loaning someone money and like taking taking money off their from their income is that you know it's very hard to enforce. And so literally maybe, making it part of like your taxation like you can you can sign away like I want to give the government I'm going to pay an extra 5% in taxes, you know above x above fifty thousand dollars a year i want to pay an extra five percent for the next 10 years to this company and you can sign a contract and the government will be like okay and they'll charge you five percent taxes give it to the company that's well, interesting the tax system the tax as a payment system is fucking atrocious i think it would be much better if it was something like plaid that just connected to your bank account or like your gusto and then just deducted the money sure with no sure. no not never touching you get the, the you get the idea you get the, you get the concept that like the government takes steps in as debt for the for the company and like enforces the contract. Oh, yeah, that's actually interesting. I hadn't thought about that before. It's an interesting idea. I think the other the other thing to take into account for like why is this taking so long it, or like why don't we have this already is norms are super powerful and uh, like I was listening to this kind of chat with um, uh, the the guy who started United Masters the other day, um, which is this company that's like trying to do this thing to, to let musicians basically own their IP and then basically like get paid like the same way that almost like startup founders get paid like more in equity or some combination of like their partially, their equity is partially purchased and they're getting cash to kind of like fund their life, but they own most of their work. Um, and the music industry for forever has just been like advances and they own everything. And then it was these 360 deals and they really own everything, including all your merch and like all like all, basically your entire public persona is owned by like the music companies. Um, and, you know, you kind of see this with like Taylor Swift recording her songs and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And that industry saw Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley has been the model has been proven to work for a long time, paying people in equity. It's great. And the music industry still for like 20 years after it was proven to work was still on the old model. And uh, it's just really hard to break the way that things have worked in the past. And I think that uh, sometimes that just takes time. So hopefully we see more of it. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Last uh, topic. Um, something fun. Have you guys learned anything recently that has surprised you? Something that's caused a double take or changed your worldview. That's a that's a tough one. Well, I want, I want to ask a different one. I want to I want to talk about. All right. I want to I want to okay. talk about if we were starting your career over today and you couldn't do what you did the first time, <laughs> what would you do right. today? Like where Perfect. you're you're you you're graduating from college, you got to start pick a job. What what you don't have any of your skills, experience, or network. What do you what do you start our job in now? Are, are we, we in twenty twenty one or are we back in two thousand? Right, right now, no, it's right now. You're graduating right now. You're graduating. I guess what 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 when is it now? It's uh, April, so you're graduating in like in like a couple months. A month. In a month. 
probably something in crypto. Probably something in crypto. I think, or I, I mean, like, what is what is going into tech? You know, in two thousand six, two thousand seven, two thousand eight was like amazing because the next you know, thirteen years after that were just kind of like this massive, insane growth. I guess after two thousand eight, um, and the the only industry where it seems like that's probably going to happen right now is either more software or crypto. Maybe biotech, you know, but it, you can't be an entrepreneur starting a tech company or like an engineer working at a tech company. Like that's those are those are out. Oh, so you, you have to pick already. something else. Okay. Pick something new, different. Yeah, I, NFT I like artist. the. Uh, <laughs> I like I like the sort of like career advice to like go into an industry where there's more jobs than people. Um, you know, like I mean, if you want, if you if you just have to go try to be an actor in LA, like go for it, but. You're gonna have a much, on average, you're gonna have a much better time in life um, going into going into the industry with more jobs. Um, and Scott Adams from Dilbert uh, has um, a line about how, like, if you can't be like in like the top 0.1 percent in a field, then just be in the top 25 percent of like two or three other like fields. And like for like like for himself as an example, he he knew how to draw and and he had an MBA. And, and, and new kind of corporate culture. And, you know, he, he wasn't the best artist, but, you know, he had, uh, he was, he was good enough at a few things that he was able to make Dilbert. Yeah. He had this unique intersection of yeah. two different fields. And, yeah. So try to think about how, what, what, what is your unique intersection? Maybe if you want to be an artist, learn also how to program and, you know, uh, maybe you'll be able to do cool, like computer art. So oh, NFTs online. Is that your thing? So you're going to make cool computer art? Exactly. <laughs> so everyone is becoming an NFT artist. Yeah. <laughs> NFT artist. That's a new career. That's a totally new career. I mean, that's basically like what mine would be. You know, you know what I would do? I'd just become a creator. That would be my whole, I'd be an, an online creator. I feel like there's a huge amount of creativity in it. And it's become like, uh, it's just becoming something that's, I think, more accepted, more mainstream, there's more support, there's more support infrastructure and companies trying to support you, you know, infrastructure in the industry and people, you know, there's a more of a middle class now of creators, people who are able to, you know, they have their niche audience and, and, uh, but then maybe not the, you know, Jake Paul or something, you know, at the, or Kim Kardashian at the top. And, and so I think that it's, uh, it's never been a better time to be a creator. And I, I do, do feel, feel like you're doing it right now. Activate. Yeah, it, it's, it's a, a lot, lot different, different for me. Because you're though, starting your second career right now. You're like, you're doing it. You're becoming a creator. Exactly. I'm starting my second career, but I, I don't have to make money, which I think makes it a lot easier. And I'm able to, like, build a team around it. So, I like, I basically can do things without having to worry about, like, is this really going to perform super well? It's more like just what the content I want to create. Yeah, exactly. Do all the grindy hard work behind the scenes to make it happen, yeah. But I want to. But I want to know, okay, Jamie. What do you do? What's your? What's your? Uh, what's your career? You can't. I, you I think it's a little bit. I think start a new tech company. That's not. That's that's not that. I think it's I a little bit hard to be like. It's a little hard to be like you're. You don't get to participate in the technology industry, which is going to be the fastest growth industry for like the next you know fifty years. Because, I mean, you should go to where the action is as someone who's like starting your career, and so. Yeah going to where the action is. I think Justin, Justin's answer is like a little bit cheating. Cause it's like, I'm going to participate in the tech industry, but just in an adjacent different way. I don't know. Maybe I would become a, maybe, maybe well, he said he started <laughs> maybe I'll become a cooking, started, I'll become a cooking influencer. Yeah, cooking influencer. Yeah, I'll become a yeah. cooking he's influencer. Going to crypto instead. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. That's different. What's, what's yours, Emmett? What's, what's, what's your answer? Um, well, it's the reason I, so this, I, I heard this question because actually I was thinking about it. I was like, I was struggling. Like, what else would I do? Like, can I even imagine a different pathway for myself? Um, and I think the thing that I, I, I would do actually is actually, it's somewhat similar, similar to you, Justin, actually. It's like, I wish that I would be, I think I would want to try to become an online, like Twitter and Substack intellectual, like, like have a, like, like write up analog, you know, a intellectual, like paid newsletter and like tweet online about interesting shit and like, have that be my, like, the public intellectual would be my like uh, that would be fun i really enjoy that i think i, well, I, he, I think part of me regrets not doing that in the, the first place this is the first step well, there's so still a, time a couple 
couple things on that actually. This first of all, this is the first step. You're basically intellectualizing on this public platform all over YouTube. Uh, number one, and number two is actually something that um, really I've internalized in the last couple of years. Is like it's not too late. You know, it's like the first day of the rest of your life. Like I want to be an online influencer now. Is now is the time. It's like very easy. It's never been a better time uh, to start. I think in in many ways because um, the the actually the growth mechanics around a lot of these platforms are like actually it was much harder to grow on Twitter, for example. Uh, five years ago than it is now because Twitter's uh, now that they've shifted fully to the algorithmic feed, they actually surface good content up uh, much more to many more people's timelines. So that you don't have like they'll surface your content. If your tweet is doing really well to surface it to more people, either through retweets or even just, you know, if someone replies to your tweet, they might surface your original tweet to, so, you know, someone who follows the, the person who replied its timeline. Right. So, um, you know, in a way, it's it's never been a better time to become an online influencer or online. Yeah, but I thought of what you're, I would you're, do. You're going to be the you're going to be the intele online intellectual, and I'm going to be the online influencer. That's right. I, I, I thought, thought about, about what I, I would do. On your podcast. Wait, Jamie, what are you doing? I'd start a grocery store in LA that isn't total garbage. Wait, no, <laughs> I, I found Erwan. it. <laughs> found it i found it air one is garbage air one is like worse than whole foods no <laughs> cookbook cookbook is the buy right of la it's really great okay i haven't been there it's like it's so good check it out i love how you yeah. think air one is garbage that's the most bougie opinion of the show <laughs> have you been to air one it's like it's not it's a worse than whole foods it's like the God. same as whole foods it's like the whole foods <laughs> if you just branded all the whole foods stuff air one instead of whole foods and then Charged charge like twenty percent more money. <laughs> it's, not, it's not yes, any better. It is, it is egregiously overpriced, but the but the prepared food is very good. It's delicious. Yeah, Although it's not as good as alien as good as Let's, 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 let's wrap. Up. Okay, we're gonna wrap up with uh, with predictions again. It's, people like that about you know you can make a prediction on anything that we've talked about in the in the show or whatever whatever you want, and then the rest of us will either agree with that or disagree, and then someone years later we'll just call everybody out for how bad their predictions were or maybe someone will have like shown proven themselves to be like an amazing prognosticator and it's like going to be the you know is the genius of the show the secret genius anybody have one i have one i love coinbase but i think that coinbase will be trading for Let's say less than one hundred fifty million dollars, one hundred fifty billion dollars in two years. Oh, mm. I, I foe. That's, I, that I, is I, Jamie. I I appreciate that because it's both like bold and like very like detestable. Like you could actually be wrong. I'm probably I wrong, think. but I'm gonna go with it anyways. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm a foe on that. Info. I think the crypto industry is only getting bigger. I mean, the, at the at the pace things are growing right now, um, I I would probably bet long, and I think tomorrow is going to be an epic day for for them. I think it's going to be. I think tomorrow is going to be epic. Yeah, Emmett, do you have an opinion on that prediction? prediction? Uh, I want the far bet where I can like bet on the valuation of Coinbase conditional on the value value of Bitcoin. <laughs> like, <laughs> you have to you have to factor in the value of bitcoin into this you have to factor the value, value of bitcoin yeah into like your, this this I, mean, I just have high uncertainty because like the you know that has high uncertainty i think what's, what happens there but i uh wait how many two years or three years two years two years uh, let's go with two, two years. years i think i said two years two years two years uh i think foe but like with like great trepidation because who the fuck knows yeah. all, all right, right i'll give my, my prediction. prediction i think, I think that, that neural link, link you're, not, you're, not, you're not with like you are you with her to against jimmy did i miss that oh, oh I, said I said foe, foe. i said, I said foe, foe already. already yeah okay so, so my jimmy prediction is yes we disagree i think it's a great jimmy, product but... i just think it's hard to compete in like a very competitive market and maintain your valuation. Although if I am wrong, I think it will be because crypto continues to explode and it, you know, 10 times as many people come into it and it won't matter if there's more players. Yeah. Um, okay. My prediction is that Neuralink will, uh, do a, 
human implantation in the next, I don't know, let's call it three years. Oh, I, was say, I think that'll happen for sure. Admit. I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say for, but... I think the over on three, I mean, I, I, I generally agree, but if I had to guess, I think the over on three, not the under. You mean it'll, it'll take longer than three years. It's like longer than three. I, I would have said five, but like, that's one of those, like, but it's sure plausible. Tcon. Yeah, I was saying. I, I think I'm going to change my answer to foe. I think that's that 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 feels really soon, but it's a space I don't know. So I'm I'm certainly rooting for them, and um, I I hope they do it. All right, it's me and Jamie against the two of you. <laughs> Emmett, you got a prediction? Uh, I predict that ISAs are going to be like however much money there is in ISAs today. I don't know the figure offhand. It will be like let's say more than three x that amount in in two years. For sure, friend. I, I, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, friend. Friend. He's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't go aggressive enough. Tcon. Mine was going to be Coinbase as well, but it was going to be about tomorrow's um, IPO. I I think. I, they're going to smash the reference price, which I think was around 250 a share. Reference price is during a direct listing. The SEC still wants you to get banks to kind of give a estimate price, and uh, I think it was lowballed. And um, I, ex I expect them to easily break 140 billion dollars of market cap tomorrow. What does that translate to on a per share price? Um, I'd have to check somewhere. In, I think it was in the 400s or something. Um, I have to double check. I hope so. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh oh, that's sitting there doing the math on you. <laughs> yes. I'm, like, I'm calculating it right now. Like, like how fast can I sell these shirts? No, I'm, just, I'm, just I'm, I'm, I'm a long-term long Coinbase holder. Total. I mean, I actually total. Am. Total. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tegan, I've learned. If I've learned one thing in our friendship, is that I should never bet against you with any crypto prediction. So I'm absolutely <laughs> friend on this because that that's that is the track record. In fact, I'm yeah. revising my my prediction on my own prediction now that I heard uh, T Gun's vote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a I'm a friend, if only because I'm I I'm a friend to my own wallet. So we're we're rooting for uh, I'm rooting for the prediction. No, but I think it's true. I think it's I think Coinbase is an amazing company and it's going to do incredibly well in the short term and the long term. Um, all right, that was it. It's, we did it. Yeah. That was a great show. Thank you all. I'll see you guys. Good work, team. You know, good work, team. See you next week. <laughs> and uh, there we go.